had gone to the former Yugoslavia just after the Kosovo War to try to figure out why did civilians die. There were about 500 civilian deaths during the war. And as we went from spot to spot, a pattern emerged. We noticed that about a quarter of the civilians died because cluster bombs had been dropped in populated areas. Well, a cluster munition is basically a, a large container, either a rocket launched from the ground or a bomb dropped from the air. And inside this large container, you have many, many smaller bombs, usually on the order of hundreds of them. And when the container opens up in midair, it spreads the bombs out over a very wide area, usually about a football field. And then you have these hundreds of bombs impacting and striking their targets. Cluster munitions are probably the largest killer of civilians besides bullets on the ground. I mean, it's bad enough that cluster bombs scatter over a wide area. And if there happen to be civilians in that area, they're likely to be killed or injured. But the harm doesn't stop there because some significant percentage of the submunitions don't explode on initial contact with the ground. And you know, you're looking at upwards of a quarter of them don't explode. And when you look at the way militaries use them today, basically millions of them coming down at any time, that's an awful lot of bombs laying on the ground for people to touch and kill them. It doesn't actually take much to make a cluster munition explode. So that if it's left on the ground, something like even a, a passing breeze can suddenly make it blow up. Everything begins with the in-depth, on-the-ground investigations conducted by our researchers. We go and we interview civilians and victims who witness the incidents. We take photos to document our evidence and use GPS coordinates to locate cluster munition strikes, and then we plot them on satellite photos when we return so that you can document, for example, how widely they were used in populated areas. Human Rights Watch more or less invented the methodology for going out and doing what we call humanitarian battle damage assessment. The military does its own battle damage assessment that looks at how effectively weapons have worked. We go in and we do a damage assessment that looks at the impact on civilians. We try to figure out not just how many civilians were killed, but even more importantly, why they were killed. What went wrong that caused these casualties? We don't take opinions, in fact, at all on whether a war should have happened or not. And we accept the reality of war, and we go into war situations and try to convince both sides to adhere as strictly as possible to the requirements of the Geneva Conventions in order to spare civilian life. Cluster munitions have been used in, um, we now count about 30 countries, but what is disconcerting is that cluster munitions are stockpiled by more than 70 countries. The level of those stockpiles is staggering. The United States alone has cluster munitions containing about one billion submunitions. Russia and China probably have a similar number. We've been primarily concerned with modifying U.S. behavior because the U.S. is the power that has used cluster munitions most extensively, dating back to the Vietnam era. They were used in Yugoslavia, they were used in Afghanistan, they were used in Iraq. And when we brought the results of our findings to the Air Force, they were taken aback. And they began to change, to their credit. And we could see over time that if you trace U.S. Air Force use of cluster bombs from Kosovo to Afghanistan and ultimately to Iraq, they changed. They amended their doctrine. And they basically stopped using cluster bombs in populated areas, basically because of the work of Human Rights Watch that began in Yugoslavia. But it's important to remember that cluster munitions can also be shot from um, rockets, and that the Army does. Um, this was a classic case, apparently, of one service not talking to the other. While the Air Force did the right thing with respect to cluster munitions, the Army just lobbed unconscionable numbers of cluster munitions into populated areas. And as you can see, this is a little village, lots of children, and very civilian area. And I'm going to go to a cluster bomb that we found. When Human Rights Watch did an on-the-ground assessment as to why civilians died, and when we revealed this pattern of, of abuse by the U.S. Army, um, I actually had occasion to then meet with several senior members of the Army. They knew that they had done something wrong, and they immediately started making excuses. Their response was that they didn't really have many choices. They hadn't taken other weapon systems with them 
to Iraq that would have allowed them to avoid using cluster munitions. The Army explained that this was a technical problem, they knew it was a problem, they were in the process of fixing it, and in essence they said, it'll never happen again. In the, the Israel Hezbollah war of the summer of 2006, we again saw extensive use of cluster munitions, this time um, in part by Hezbollah, but mainly by Israel. During the last three days of the war, Israel simply rained cluster munitions over large parts of southern Lebanon. Yesterday, a guy was picking grapes, grapes and the cluster bomb fell on him. Just to compare the Iraq War in 2003 with Lebanon in 2006, during a three-week war, the U.S. and the U.K. dropped about two million cluster munitions in Iraq. In 2006, in only three days, Israel dropped twice that, four million. You can see the fuse has been broken. You know, one of the really critical aspects of emergencies work is that we're on the scene as things happen and we're able to respond in real time. Well, for example, when we were in southern Lebanon and we heard just moments earlier there had been some children injured by cluster bombs, and we learned about how these three kids had been injured. One child uh, was eviscerated. Uh, his cousin uh, had, had part of her liver taken out, and another child had her legs injured. Uh, luckily, these survived, but not everyone did. Human Rights Watch has pushed for the adoption of a treaty that explicitly restricts the use of cluster munitions. Um, we did something very similar with anti-personnel landmines. We pushed for a treaty outlawing uh, anti-personnel landmines and ultimately succeeded in getting one and, and in sharing in the Nobel Peace Prize as a result. We are now in the process of doing the exact same thing with respect to cluster munitions. There's an international arena for conversations about conventional weapons called the Convention on Conventional Weapons, uh, which is perhaps, as its name suggests, a fairly bureaucratic and slow-moving process. And part of what needed to happen uh, to get movement on cluster munitions was to take the negotiation out of that process and put it on a faster track. It has put the focus of the effort to ban cluster munitions where the focus needs to be, and that is on the affected states. Our views are being listened to. We've helped to draft principles for the treaty. We've helped to draft treaty language itself. We're deeply involved in the process. One of the things that's different about treaty making in the modern age is that a non-governmental organization like Human Rights Watch has practically a seat at the table. We are present at the birth of a treaty in a way that non-diplomats haven't been throughout history. The new treaty will prohibit the use, stockpiling, production, and trade of cluster munitions. This is one of those moments in time where NGOs and governments working together can literally save thousands and thousands, maybe millions and millions of lives and limbs in the future. Cluster munitions are going to become a dirty word just like landmines have become.